Buenas noches, eh, señores miembros de la Academia Argentina de Cirugía eh, y cirujanos interesados en la actividad de esta academia a través de nuestra transmisión online, como ustedes saben, funcionando desde el año 2020 en forma virtual debido a las restricciones ocasionadas por la pandemia de COVID-19. Eh, iniciamos esta segunda sesión del mes de mayo de 2021. Eh, el primer punto es la consideración y aprobación del acta de la sesión nosotros, anterior, eh, señores, que, ya fue, eh, que ya fue discutido previamente. Eh, le paso la palabra al doctor Manuel Montesinos para que eh, nos comente los asuntos centrados. Doctor Montesinos, ¿está silenciado? Disculpe. Vuelve a estar silenciado. Estar silenciado. Ahora. Ahora sí. Bueno, buenas noches, Gracias, doctor Figari. Se recuerda a los asistentes a estas sesiones, la asistencia se puede registrar en el formulario del link que se copia en el chat en vivo, sea en las categorías de miembros de la academia o no miembros, y que la asistencia al 50% de las sesiones del año anterior es uno de los requisitos para ingresar como miembro asociado o para pasar de miembro asociado a miembro académico. Aquellos miembros de la academia que estén interesados en hacer algún aporte o comentario oral sobre los trabajos leídos en las sesiones pueden hacerlo saber con anticipación a la Secretaría a fin de ser incluidos en el estado del Zoom. La participación, participación estará limitada a un máximo de cinco minutos. Existe interés en que los trabajos leídos en esta academia sean enviados para su publicación a la revista argentina de cirugía. Los manuscritos deberán ser enviados por los autores a la Secretaría de la Revista, y la presentación deberá ajustarse a su reglamento y todos los trabajos serán enviados a revisión por pares de acuerdo con las políticas de calidad editorial. La presentación de casos clínicos es una de las modalidades que la Comisión Directiva considera incluir en las próximas sesiones. A tal fin se solicita de la academia y el envío de casos no interactivos para integrar la sábana de futuras sesiones. Se llama concurso del 10 al 24 de mayo para optar a cinco cargos de miembro académico, cinco cargos de miembro asociado y cinco cargos de miembro correspondiente nacional. El primero de mayo, el 31 de julio, se realiza la inscripción de trabajos para optar al premio Academia Argentina de Cirugía. Los trabajos deberán ser inéditos, realizados en Argentina, y los autores no deben ser miembros de la Academia Argentina de Cirugía. Por último, la próxima sesión, el miércoles eh, 19 de mayo, escucharemos la comunicación del papel de la hiperbilirrubinemia en la sensibilidad de la biopsia biliar endoluminal percutánea. Resultado en 93 pacientes con sospecha de estenosis biliar maligna. Los autores, Aldo Guero, Florencia Di Rocco, Pablo Hueste, Eduardo Mullen, Martín de Santibáñez, Rodrigo Sánchez Claria, Oscar Massa, Juan Picol, Eduardo de Santibáñez y Sun Joyón. Nada más. Eh, muchas gracias, eh, doctor Montesinos. Eh, no existen eh, asuntos... Eh y discusiones atrasadas, por lo cual pasaremos a la actividad del día de hoy. Tenemos el agrado de contar con nosotros con el doctor Rifat de Latifi de Nueva York, un experto en la, en la cirugía en general, pero en este caso va a ilustrarnos acerca de su experiencia en reconstrucción compleja de la pared abdominal, y le hemos pedido al doctor Alberto Ferreres, ex presidente de esta academia, que por favor lo presente. Doctor Ferreres. Muchas gracias, señor presidente. Agradezco al señor presidente y a los miembros de la comisión directiva la posibilidad de presentarlo al profesor Latifi. Y si me permiten, yo estoy compartiendo la pantalla. Para mí es un distinct privilege to introduce to all our audience Professor Rifat Lafiti. Professor Latifi was born in a small town close to the town of Pristina, Klodernice, in what used to be ancient uh, or um, Serbia and formerly Yugoslavia. Right now is the country of Kosovo and Pristina is the capital city, which has close links with Albania, which is very close as you can see in the map. 
Here you have the new uh, flag from Kosovo, and here you see the relationship between Kosovo and Serbia and all former Yugoslavia. Professor Latifi uh, completed his medical school at the University of Pristina in 1982. Then he was completed his starting years as a resident there. And in 1985, he decided to cross the Atlantic Ocean and retrain in the US. He started working in Texas and in Pennsylvania, and then he moved on, uh, completed the general surgery residency at the Yale School, University School of Medicine. And I would like to highlight two of his mentors, very well-known individuals, Professor Stanley Dudrick, the father of uh, uh, parental nutrition, and Professor Merritt, who was his boss at Yale and later when he moved in his first position in academic surgery at Virginia Commonwealth University. Both of them have been a couple of times from Argentina, my good friends. So he then moved on a surgical critical care fellowship at Cornell, and then he started, as I mentioned, at DCU. Then he moved to the University of Arizona. And since more than 10 years, he's the professor of chair at the New York Medical College. He has been the editor of eight books, more than 100 contributions to medical literature, and a developer of telemedicine and telesurgery. As, and one of his biggest uh, awards was the 2015 American College of Surgeons Pfizer International Surgical Volunteerism Award, which won the most important um, accolades uh, offered by the ACS. And I have the pleasure and the honor to uh, sponsor his nomination for that uh, prize. He has been a long um, standing contributor to the development of surgery in Kosovo. This picture is a, um, a screen capture from a couple of days ago where he opened the initial session at the Kosovo College of Surgeons and the launching of the Kosovo Journal of Surgery. And the world has been uh, the witness of many encounters with Professor Latifi in his role as an amazing individual, an ethical surgeon, and a gifted master educator. Thank you once again, Professor Latifi, for your contribution, which I have no doubt will be really very interesting. Uh, and thank you, Professor Figari, President and Executive Board of the uh, Argentine Surgical Academy. Thank you, Dr. Ferreres. Uh, Dr. Latifi, it is a honor for us to, to have you in our academy and uh, this virtual way for the, for the academy allow us to have your presence here and we are ready to attend to your conference. And after your conference, two members of the academy will make sure comments on the relevant content. Dr. Latifi, the screen is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Professor Figari, and thank you, uh, Professor uh, Ferreres. I really, I am very honored uh, to be here. So let me try to share my screen, uh, and uh, then we'll uh, uh, see. It's going to work. Can you all see the screen? Perfect. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm truly honored uh, to be able to share. Uh, what has become a, a real passion of mine uh, in recent years. Uh, some people call it a, a life-changing operation for many of our patients. And uh, I'll show you some of the uh, experience that I had over the last uh, uh, 10 years or so. I do wanna thank uh, Professor Marcello Figari for a really honor uh, to be here. And uh, my great friend, Alberto Ferreras, whom uh, as you saw from a few pictures, we knew each other now for many years. Uh, a truly honor to be among all of you. I'm gonna try to uh, go over quickly over what uh, uh, I think abdominal wall defects, uh, how should be fixed and how we do it in here. Uh, despite all, I just wanna recognize that surgery is the easiest part of what we do with these patients, irrespective of how difficult uh, they may look to, to, to people who do not do this. And I'm gonna try to answer the basic two questions. Uh, uh, when and how to repair these, uh, these often devastating uh, hernias. Uh, these are my uh, disclosures. Uh, it has become a major uh, interest of mine. 
uh, with these books being published as a second edition recently, I think it's gonna to go to the third one. It's become really a major clinical and research portfolio. Uh, our group has published uh, quite a bit of this. So I'm just gonna get through, through those very quickly. Uh, we're trying to figure out when and how to do it. And these patients certainly are quite uh, uh, sick patients overall. Um, and use of biologic mesh and readmissions and so forth. And, uh, and, and these are some of our uh, most recent uh, publications. I, I'm not gonna stay stopping here at all. I'm just gonna move through these anatomy, but uh, I have a feeling uh, that some of us general surgeons who do not do this on a regular basis, almost ignore the anatomy of the abdominal wall. Uh, and we do not recognize the fact that the abdominal wall is a very dynamic structure that helps us just about with everything that we do. And uh, thus uh, it's really important, uh, particularly if we have any young uh, surgeons to recognize this and to review this on, on a regular basis. We all know these pictures uh, and the side of the slide. We all, as we uh, trying to get ready for repair these hernias, but frankly, I think this is one of the most important thing that we need uh, to do. Recognize the blood supply, recognize the zones that have been so well uh, defined and, uh, and as well as both uh, arterial and venous drainage. Obviously these patients have a lot of pain post-op. So we, uh, in our group, every most, uh, unless they have some significant contraindication, they get uh, epidural uh, catheter. This is probably the picture that every surgeon, whoever does any hernias of the abdominal wall know this picture. I'm not gonna go through this, but uh, I think this is gonna be, uh, sort of an outline of my talk. So what is complex abdominal defect? I think it takes one to see one. You see it and you recognize that that there is really difficult, but let me show you a couple of pictures. I believe that every one of you would agree that every one of these hernias is gonna be pretty difficult and it's very complex. It's complex when we used to uh, give patients 20 liters of fluid to resuscitate them and they couldn't close the abdomen and then we will, uh, uh, rely on damage control and so on. So I, I would uh, think that these are pretty complex. Or if you uh, see this patient post-op day uh, three or four or five or seven usually, that's a pretty, pretty difficult uh, thing to do and, and so on. High, high output, uncontrollable, multiple fistulas uh, when patients basically uh, live in, in a terrible conditions. Uh, or those when you have difficulties making sense of tissue at hand, you're trying to fix something that is very difficult to actually recognize if it's a small bowel, large bowel, proximal or distal. This is a patient that she absolutely refused to die. Uh, and uh, you can see her liver growing down and her, her down in, in the abdomen. And unfortunately, uh, fortunately she did very well and was probably one of the best uh, and easiest uh, Case of then this is one case that we have done. Uh, uh, we put uh, balloons here uh, to to extend uh, and increase the size of skin so we can we can cover them. And he's now uh, you know just the, during the or pre uh, pre before the operation. So the. In our practice, and I think I believe that everyone else practice should be established very disciplined protocol and a well-planned strategy to improve post-operative care. Because I think, uh, as I mentioned before, surgery may be difficult, but it really it's still an uh, easy part of things. So the question that we need to answer is, when should we fix it? And how should we fix it to, at all? Perhaps we may not be able to fix uh, cases like this. This is a patient refused to die. As you can see, she's very malnourished. And at some point you just have to, as we say, bite the bullet and, and uh, operate. But I really, I still do not know when is a good time or when is the best time to fix uh, these hernias. I don't know this and I, I read a bunch of, a lot of papers and I wrote some of them myself. 
And I think we just need to do a personalization of patient's care and, and just take one patient at a time as we do it. How should we fix it? I think, as I mentioned before, I think a patient tailored approach uh, is the patient is a patient of fistulas or stomas or no fistulas or no stomas. I think that's somewhat uh, different. Controlling sepsis, uh, optimizing nutrition, uh, wound care, and time in anatomy and surgery has been well described in the literature, and it's uh, really uh, a six-step uh, procedure. I. I thought there was something missing here. And so we added a few more. It's a long acronym and probably no one's gonna be able to remember. But the optimization is not just nutrition. If the patient has hernias uh, uh, in, a, in a face of a, a liver failure uh, and it's really in a really bad shape, perhaps placement of tips uh, should be done. Obviously we have to redefine the anatomy. We need to discuss again, timing of surgery. And I, I call it some surgical creativity, or as I tell the medical students, surgical creativity is that you make things up as you go in the operating room. Uh, then uh, important stuff that uh, has been missed on the first uh, paper by Vichers and, and all is the post-operative care and the long-term follow-up of these patients. So defining anatomy is really uh, substantially important. You kind of Sometimes you find uh, differences. You find a few things that you may be uh, surprised on a CT scan. Uh, this is another uh, CT that uh, shows clearly that part of the liver is outside. We, as I'm going to mention this one more time, we ask uh, our radiologist to do a Valsalva CT scan uh, on all uh, these patients. Uh, if we can, let me just. So once we decide to, op to, to operate on the patient, then I think sometimes getting the, in, a, in, a, in the abdomen may be really a difficult part. By def definition, the abdominal wall in most patients with fistulas or be it intercutaneous or interatmospheric is hostile and avoiding going through the same incision. I, pr I pref uh, prefer to go around uh, the wound like anyone else. As you can, you can see it here, I don't really go through uh, midline incision. I'm sure uh, some of you in the audience who do this a lot, you do the same, same uh, use the same technique. I took a picture of, uh, I asked uh, Ari Lepaniemi to send me a picture of his backyard. That's his uh, icy uh, lake. I think there's no difference between this picture of the hostile abdomen with all these multiple fistulas that will never heal unless you operate and this. So uh, sometimes you just have to really uh, bite the bullet and, and, and try to get in. I uh, show this slide because I think getting in is the most difficult part. And I don't think so anyone should go fishing or golfing or dinner plans that day because it's gonna take, <laughs> it's gonna take lots of time uh, to get in and to finish it. So I usually book the case for five to six, seven hours now I'm becoming brave. I'm booking two a day, which is really a bad idea because one night I was till 11 o'clock in the hospital. I will never do this again on these complex ones. A lot of these patients are, uh, at least in my practice, are sent by surgeons uh, and had many operations in the past. They have a lot of meshes. So I try to ex uh, ex ex excise the mesh and mobilize the entire uh, length of intestines from ligament detrites to rec recto sigmoid. And then uh, you look at this, uh, <laughs> uh, it's tedious, as you can see here, it's really, uh, you may make a lot of new uh, enterotomies. As I go, I, I will put a suture and I will leave a long string so I can find it because after five, six hours, you're gonna be exhausted and you may not be able actually to find the small holes that you, that you make. Uh, so excise in a mesh, I think it's, uh, uh, I'm just going to speed this up. So you have to remove the entire mesh and I'll, in a, in a bit, I'll show you why.
Unfortunately, uh, a lot of surgeons, at least in the United States, uh, when they see the mesh layer, they just add another piece of mesh. So I took, I took the other day four meshes in one patient and in the hernia present at the same time. So you kind of have to remove these uh, uh, completely as, as you go. So as you see this, this one has, a, has a, a, had one big mesh that was put laparoscopically, then in the middle had the uh, hernia. So they added another layer of this mesh and eventually, hopefully, uh, we try to remove everything out. This is just a picture of an infected phasic mesh. Uh, and this is post-excision. Suppose this is supposed to be uh, uh, absorbed at some point, but has not. And uh, after removing the mesh, I put this, uh, as you can see, biologic mesh and a drain over it. So should we take the entire mesh or partially? Well, we did a study recently. Uh, one of my fellows, Dr. Gachabayev, uh, did a meta-analysis on this. And from five observational studies in, with 421 patients were included in this meta-analysis. And rate of infection recurrence we're 58.5% uh, in uh, uh, partial removal of a mesh uh, and 25 or 62 in a complete uh, removal mesh. So uh, clearly we should, we should remove uh, the mesh uh, completely. If you're lucky, your fistulas are in one segment, you take that and then you do, uh, you do the anastomosis. Sometimes you have to do multiple anastomosis. Uh, I use often uh, stricture of plasty, particularly in the patients who have uh, multiple hernias and multiple fistulas or anastomosis, and the, you, they run a risk to become a short uh, gut syndrome patients. We do hands-on anastomosis. Uh, don't use staplers in, in, in most of these cases. Uh, on occasion, I will use, uh, I'll do the multi, the uh, combined channel uh, with stapler and then close the mouth of the channel with hands-on anastomosis. But for the most part, we do hands-on anastomosis. We do need to have a multidisciplinary approach and advanced surgical techniques uh, as, as needed. We're trying to use uh, native uh, down wall whenever you can, and if not possible, biologic or prosthetic mesh. Although most of the hernias really need some sort of uh, enforcement, at least in my opinion. Uh, component separation as a junk procedure during complex abdominal reconstructions uh, has been clearly uh, written long, uh, for a long period of time now, uh, for maybe 70 years or so. Uh, there are two types, uh, anterior component separation and a posterior component separation. I think anterior component separation is easier to do, and I did it for a long period of time, and then when I switched in 2017, I almost exclusively used posterior component separation. And this is not new. This is one of your guys, uh, Alfonso Albanese, uh, this, described this in 1951. Uh, and unfortunately, uh, the new uh, uh, gentleman who described it does not really refer to this paper at all. Uh, so this is the original paper of uh, Dr. Albanese. It describes this uh, in, a, in, a, uh, in the this, this skid uh, in 1951. Other people have done, uh, and these are references from Dr. Albanese's paper, and uh, sort of it was rediscovered in the United States uh, by Ramirez and co-workers in, his, in their elegant study in 1990. But this is the original uh, paper that I could find in the literature. So these are, uh, uh, this is a gentleman that I operated on him when I was in Doha, Qatar, uh, and I didn't have any biologic mesh, so, and I didn't really want to use uh, synthetic mesh. So I covered this guy one night uh, to resuscitate him with the Vicro mesh and then closed him next day, uh, clearly uh, doing an anterior component separation. I was able to uh, medialize both uh, recti muscles. This is a gentleman, I have his permission to use his picture. He had a lot of drains, but he did uh, really very well post opportunity. I saw him about five years later in Qatar, and he still looks to looks very good. One of the 
important papers, in my opinion, that came out from Dr. Parker is uh, uh, trying to figure out the real nomenclature of uh, mesh placement and what, what do we use? And so there are a lot of uh, literature is almost uh, uh, flooded with, do we use onlay or overlay or sublay or underlay and so on and so forth. I, we have now changed to this one to retroactive sublay, which is uh, taking down the posterior rectus sheet and then placing uh, the mesh under the muscle and above the rectus, the rectus sheet. These are the data from uh, uh, Dr. Albanese. Ipsilateral advance of approximately seven to 10 centimeters at mid abdomen. I had, I had shown this many, many times as, as probably most of you have done that you can close a 20 centimeter defect in the abdominal wall very easily actually. Uh, and you can see this an epigastric vessel is somewhat more difficult. Suprapubically is as well somewhat difficult. Uh, but I find it uh, really easy to, to close it. Uh, this is a, a, a cartoon of the comp anterior component separation. And then the question becomes where to put this mesh uh, and what junk techniques to use. Uh, I did this for a long period of time, actually after I would do anterior component separation, I would put the mesh underlay here directly into the abdominal wall on, 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 uh, uh, on, on top of the bowel. This was uh, associated with difficult, many problems, and in fact, and most of them were uh, skin related and, and subcutaneous tissue related because I didn't really know how to fix the, the mesh. So I was cleaning the entire abdominal wall, cleaning the fascia, and then do the suture every couple of centimeters for fear that the intestine is going to get into it until I saw someone doing it uh, in a proper way. So this is just another uh, cartoon. If you do this anterior component separation with mesh uh, underlay, you make sure that you need to take the suture into the recto into the external obliques. Uh, otherwise you'll uh, really, you'll have a hernia fixed in the middle, but you get two hernias out of it. These are just some of the uh, pictures. We didn't really have a, a big biologic mesh that we use. Uh, so sometimes I would use uh, two pieces. On occasion, I would use a synthetic mesh if the if a, a work group hernia class is one, sometimes in two, uh, but most of these patients I deal with have really contaminated or high risk for infections. One study that I'm not gonna show you, but uh, we uh, recently did it, uh, patients who had intra-abdominal uh, infections in the past, 46% of them will have a wound infection. So it's really important uh, to, to get the history from the patient in the past. This is just, a, if you use a bridge, uh, which is, I try to avoid as much as I can, but if you don't have really a down wall, uh, then you kind of need to do a parachute technique going inside about five to six centimeters from the edge. And frankly, these guys will, these patients will get a hernia at some point. If you do that, trying to uh, cover the mesh with the skin and subcutaneous tissue as much as you can. Overlay a reinforcement. Uh, we really do not do this any, any longer. Uh, I think the last time I did this was probably uh, 10 years or so, but just uh, for illustration uh, purposes. So the most of the things I do, we do now, it's a retrorectus. Uh, you can see it, uh, I'll show you a better picture than these. One of, one of my uh, research fellows, Dr. Choi, who's gonna go to plastic sur surgery, he, he did this animation. And I can see, you can see that's a, a, a rectus abdominis. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> uh, that's, uh, those are the uh, inferior epigastric vessels and uh, a posterior rectus uh, fascia. So uh, he, this kind of in, in the base, uh, how we do it. And uh, this is again, this picture, just to uh, illustrate again, uh, the rectal rectal sheet face. I'm gonna run this uh, just very shortly, this uh, video. It's really important. Uh, this is a resident uh, doing the operation. I'm helping them. OK, 
can see here the uh, procedure rectal sheet um, well defined. So can we do these abdominal wall reconstruction during acute phase uh, of injury or a post catastrophic event? Uh, I always, uh, I think damage control has done great things for patients around the world, saved a lot of lives, but with a significant cost. So uh, this is a gentleman who actually about two weeks prior was operated for trauma, had a, a laparotomy, and uh, he had, uh, it was operated in another hospital. So he comes in, he's having abdominal pain, and the CT scan is not that good. He has hernia. And as you can see, he has a drain inside. So basically, uh, we did this reconstruction on him. Uh, and just, I'm going to go through this a little bit faster. So we, I decided to do a posterior rectal sheet uh, release and uh, place a, a piece of mesh. Uh, so he clearly will not have a hernia piece. Not, not for, for, for a while, so. And, and after we can, so can we perform the definitive abdominal closure post damage control uh, or with active infection? Well, I'm sure you, you uh, uh, colleagues of mine uh, in Argentina have exactly the same experience as we do, we have a lot of, uh, old people who get in operated for different things, and I particularly uh, uh, major hernias who were sick. And for some reason, we just like to pass the baton on and say, well, you know, you're not exactly dying. So if you need to do, we can operate later. So these are uh, patients with a major uh, incarcerated insertional hernia and uh, dead intestines. This is post op day four. Uh, uh, we did this, we fixed him with a complex abdominal reconstruction. This is another guy with a uh, post aortic rupture managed with open abdomen post up day 10. Maybe in Argentina differently, but I think our vascular surgeons now almost had forgotten how to do an open aortic repair, uh, particularly emergency. So we have some serious complications uh, from these uh, cases. Uh, these are some other uh, cases. So this is actually this is a fascinating case. This is a seat belt injury with complete disruption of the abdominal wall bilaterally. Uh, and we fixed uh, this patient, I think uh, day two or three when he came in the hospital. And this is infected mesh uh, and uh, incarcerated bowel in this large hernia. This is another one uh, with a ruptured aortic aneurysm. This is a, a patient who had uh, um, major uh, sinus tract infections, uh, post bunch of a uh, few times having mesh. And this is his, uh, um, his CT scan showing. Uh, Great, thank you. Intestines attached uh, to the abdominal wall that was that there was draining. So. So we worked, uh, we recently published this study actually just this spring uh, in March. Uh, should we, when should we uh, fix these hernias? These abdominal wall reconstructions should we do early versus delayed? Uh, this was a pooled analysis of about 236 patients from our retrospective and prospective database retrospectives uh, from 2013 to 2016. Uh, and the outcomes of seven and nine patients in an E group or early group, which means at the same time of the hospitalizations without leaving the hospital, uh, were compared with 150 patients who had delayed, uh, delayed repair. Uh, most of the things were the same. So com comprehensive complication index was none significant in other groups, they were no different. Uh, surgical site infections were not different, necrosis, unplanned reoperations, and, and so on. So all of these indicators, uh, 30 days, 90 days, and 120 days readmission and cumulative uh, hospital length of stay, and, and so on. 
So as you as you can see, basically uh, using uh, using uh, some fancy statistical analysis, uh, the only early uh, abdominal wall reconstruction was actually uh, acceptable, and there was no major, more complication than than the other cases. So we conclude in this study. Uh, that early complex abdominal wall reconstruction can, with biologic match, can be safely performed. Uh, Preoperative complication and mortality rate were the same as in those undergoing elective uh, complex abdominal wall reconstruction. And early uh, reconstruction was predictive of shorter cumulative hospital length of stay. It actually makes sense. It's a very common sense study because these patients stay in the hospital a couple of months. We put a wound vac, get a, a skin graft, and eventually they go home. They stay home for a year without, oper without working, without being functional, and then eventually come for a next repair. So we have now ongoing study of our patients. Every, one, every patient since 2016 uh, undergoes Valsalva CT scan. Preoperatively, we are given a quality, we give patients quality of life surveys, including 36 item short form questionnaire. And then we see postoperatively the patient at two weeks, one month, three months, six months, and then yearly until they are three years after uh, the repair. These surveys are then repeated at six months and then one, two, and third, and third year. We try to, we have divided our group of patients into cirrhotic and post-transplant patients, uh, elderly, greater than 65 years old, uh, acute phase or post damage control, as I mentioned, and recurrent hernias, and the presence or absence of mesh. We have done now about 236 patients since 2016, and these are the characteristics of them. Uh, most of them are uh, three ages, about 60 years old. 38.1% are all elderly, uh, majority are male. Uh, 75 or almost 76% of them have ASA three class or above, and 40% had history of prior uh, hernia repair. 69% uh, or 70% were in an elective setting, 30% when done emergently. 80% now has been done through the posterior component separation. Uh, and 77.1% of the mesh was placed in a retrorectus or sublay fashion. Uh, sometimes there is no space to put it because it has been violated many times. So you took the mesh together with the retrorectus sheet. So you have to just do underlay completely. And about 80% of them had primary wound uh, closure. 19% had alcohol abuse, 19% had cirrhosis, uh, and 25% uh, uh, had history of liver transplant due to cirrhosis and so on, and 14% of overall patients had ascites. So a special category of patients that we have most difficulties, and I think every surgeon has, is uh, those with hernia, with cirrhosis and ascites. So where should we fix it? Early, electively, because I believe they do not, the hernia don't get smaller. I never read a study that hernia shrunk somehow, they all get bigger. And how should we fix it and should we use a mesh? I use the same technique. Uh, this, is Shev this is a patient in the operating table who had, uh, you cannot see it here, but has a large uh, hernia bilaterally. And we'll do the same thing as we do it, as I mentioned before, this is after we close the incision and over the, uh, over the posterior rectus sheet. These are really uh, very sick patients. I was talking to my wife and I showed her this picture. She's not a doctor. And she said, what are these spiders? I said, that's vessels. And she goes, how are you gonna go into the belly uh, and not cut them? I said, I'm gonna dance with these vessels. So I think, each of us have to dance in the operating room with these patients. Uh, this is a patient I'm gonna operate uh, June 1st. And it's just her CT scan, uh, massive ascites with the intestines in that. And sometimes you have to rely on, uh, on patients uh, and you, you get your colleagues from transplant team, just in case uh, you need to do a protocol shunt or something really uh, bad because they have some awful, uh, awful, uh, um, Various C's. This is Dr. Sego Nishida, our chief of liver transplant. He was helping me with another case, and I'm going to show you uh, the video of it. 
So these are uh, very common. This is the patient that Dr. Nishida helped me with, and these are post-transplant. Uh, some of them have multiple uh, problems. They have stomas and so on. And this is uh, an umbilical hernia uh, from uh, uh, on a liver, on liver patients. I really like this study. It was uh, published. Uh, uh, it's from Brazil, uh, Sao Paulo, uh, with a lot of people from uh, United States and then as well as from, from uh, uh, Brussels, and uh, and this I think this is the same uh, same uh, group of people uh, that published this study. So what they did, they did it prospectively, studied 246 patients. They divided in two groups. They gave a, a, a choice to the patient: Do you want to operate now, or you want to wait for when it becomes emergent? Uh, fascinating study. Elective hernia repair was performed in 57 of these patients and 189 chose to, to were kept in a conservative care as they decided to do. Of which 43 or 22.7% developed complications that required emergency hernia repair. Elective surgery provided better five year survival than conservative care, 80% versus uh, 62%. Those who undergone uh, surgical treatment, uh, multivariate uh, analysis revealed that MELT greater than 11 uh, and emergency hernia repair were as independent risk factor for 30 day mortality. Uh, the lesson to me uh, from this study is wait and see approach jeopardizes cirrhotic patients and should be avoided given the higher incidence of emergency surgery due to hernia complications. So I practice what these uh, folks have uh, already uh, shown uh, very eloquently. So we have done a few cases on this. And uh, again, uh, I'm gonna play, not this complex. Video. I'm gonna play uh, this one. This is a, um, one of the cases I just showed you that I asked Dr. Nishida to help me. A patient has a 57-year-old male with a past medical history of alcohol cirrhosis complicated by ascites, prior COVID infections, CKD, gallstones, and significant abdominal wall varices. He had a preoperative diagnosis of a very large umbilical hernia as well as a right inguinal hernia. We see here is Capring score was five. In this clip score calculating preoperative for umbilical hernia with our so here in his labs, we see he had a meld of 16 due to his elevated bilirubin 9R. Preoperatively, he had a negative COVID. Urinalysis was negative. EKG was unchanged. And so the plan was to do an umbilical hernia repair to go to the ICU postoperatively. Here we see his preoperative CAT scan showing significant abdominal wall varices, a moderate amount of intra-abdominal ascites, here we see the varices by the hernia sac, and here we see a large umbilical hernia with loculated ascites on the inside. I did not fix that inguinal hernia that OR. day because I was exhausted afterwards. So, carefully to avoid any of the large vessels. Here we can see the hernia sac is now separated off. And here we see the loculated ascites it contained. The skin overlying the hernia sac was then excised off and was sent to pathology. Based for our mesh and to protect the intra-abdominal components. Here we see a couple of large varices right above the posterior rectus sheath. We then imbricated the posterior rectus sheath to create a more watertight seal. See here, we place the sutures on either side and then meet in the middle to tie uh, the posterior rectus sheath together and protect the bowels underneath. Here we see the posterior, posterior rectus sheath that is now fully closed, along with a significant varicy with a significant amount of blood flowing through it. One of my transplant uh, colleagues said, that's audible bleeding. That when you do that, that bleeds, uh, sutures, you hear the bleeding. So. Which sutured it to the end. You can see the mesh with the drain over top of it. Here's a post-operative CT that was done a couple of days later. 
you still see a significant abdominal wall of varices. Here we see the drain coming down, and here is the mesh. No signs of hernia, very small amount of fluid that the drain is removing, and the patient is doing very well postoperatively. He actually was discharged uh, to, from the hospital uh, about 10 days later. Uh, and the reason we got a CT scan because he had this swelling uh, on the right side that I thought 100% he has some sort of big bleeding and turned out that he didn't really have any. So this is a paper that we, this is a video uh, paper that we published in Kirguia uh, Hispanica, uh, Spaniola. So um, uh, one of my uh, uh, medical student, Luis Quintero is going to surgery, uh, narrated this. So I thought, uh, I was very happy that I was able to get a hold of this video today. Reconstrucción de la pared abdominal para el manejo de hernia umbilical en pacientes cirróticos con asitis. Video demostrativo de la técnica. Hemos realizado 20 reconstrucciones complejas de pared abdominal en pacientes cirróticos con asitis activa, 11 de los cuales tenían hernia incisional, mientras 9 tenían hernia umbilical. Adicionalmente, 7 de los 20 pacientes habían recibido un procedimiento TIPS antes de la cirugía. En este video presentamos el caso de un paciente cirrótico con hernia umbilical grande, la cual estaba drenando líquido acítico. El plan de trabajo consistió en realizar una tomografía abdominal para identificar el contenido y extensión de la hernia. Intraoperatoriamente, un saco herniario grande fue identificado y el líquido acítico aspirado. A medida que se realiza la disección por planos, se evidencia una gran cantidad de líquido acítico. Mientras se extiende la incisión, más líquido acítico es aspirado y se produce ruptura de las loculaciones. Después se realiza transección del saco herniario usando un ligature. Un defecto en la pared abdominal fue identificado y usado para entrar de forma segura al abdomen. La incisión fue extendida superior e inferiormente y la hoja posterior de la vaina de los rectos fue identificada un centímetro lateral a la línea alba. Después se realizó una separación de componentes con preservación de estructuras neurovasculares. O visión directa. Un dren de Blake de 19 French es colocado sobre la malla, permitiendo el drenaje seroemático. Aquí mostramos la tomografía abdominal posoperatoria, donde evidenciamos una reconstrucción exitosa de la pared abdominal. Posterior a la recuperación, el paciente fue egresado sin complicaciones, y estas imágenes son de los controles posoperatorios. Reconstrucción. So, I just use my last couple of slides. We have done uh, by now 46 of these patients out of 232 patients. Uh, and again, we have them on all uh, approved uh, part of the study. Uh, from the, these cirrhotic patients, 74% uh, were greater than 50 years old, majority male, 70% uh, of them have alcohol abuse, and 67% uh, have uh, uh, basically ascites, active ascites, and a lot of them have contaminated wounds. So I will... Uh, uh, they do need uh, high performance prediction so far. We have done well uh, based on reoperation, SSI wound necrosis, and so on. We did better than what it meant. And I'm going to stop here. Uh, and I appreciate uh, uh, the uh, opportunity to uh, share uh, our work here at uh, Westchester Medical Center and New York Medical College. And I'll be very happy to hear the comments and questions from anyone. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Latifi. Please, can we stop sharing the screen? Okay. Thank you very much for your very comprehensive, well-illustrated conference. And also, thank you very much, also on behalf of many members of our academy, for your mention to, to, to Professor um, Albanese, who was really a champion in Argentinian surgery. It was very, very nice from your side. 
and, uh, and a, a very good uh, recall from our surgical hero. Uh, Dr. Latifi, uh, I will now uh, introduce you Dr. Yudika, uh, who is from the, um, is working in charge of the general service department at the Hospital Austral in Buenos Aires. And Dr. Fernando Yudica will now make a comment to your conference. Dr. Yudica? You are muted right now, Dr. Yeah. Dr. Yudica, we cannot hear you. Yes. Thank you very much, Professor Latifi. And it was a great conference. Very, you speak very quiet, very clear. And uh, I want to do, I want to do two or three questions for you. Um, because when, when you start the, uh, your, your conference, you say, I'm, 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 I will speak about complex abdominal wall reconstruction. And you say complex abdominal uh, wall is one of those is lobes of abdominal domain and multiple fistulas. And the question is, um, when, you, when you start to define a loose abdominal domain, and how do you prepare the, the space? Because you have to gain the loose space and you have to avoid compartmental syndrome. That one is the first question. The second question is, what happened Dr. Yudica, Dr. Yudica. yes, we yes. stop here allowing Dr. Latifi to answer the, the, the first question. The first Dr. one. Latifi? Okay. Yes, well, that's a really awesome question. Probably the most, uh, most important questions. I think uh, reconstruction of the complex abdominal defects requires a few things. Uh, a lot of people do uh, what I showed you, putting the balloons and expansions uh, of the skin and subcutaneous tissue. A lot of them give buttocks to the muscles and so on. I have given up on both of them uh, myself. I think uh, if it's even uh, up to 20 centimeters horizontally, I think we can do it very safely, uh, put the down, the, the down wall uh, together. I tell patients that I, will, I may have to keep you asleep for a couple of days and fully paralyzed. Uh, because to avoid exactly abdominal uh, compartment syndrome. Uh, they will have some hypertension, no question about that. Uh, what, I, what, what I like to do is talk to, to anesthesiologists that keep them fully paralyzed as we go. And if, and when I close the posterior rectus sheet, if the pressure, uh, ventilatory pressures go more than, change more than five, assuming they are fully paralyzed, then I will leave the patient asleep. If not, then I will uh, uh, certainly uh, open. We do measure compartment syndrome on a regular basis postoperatively. So far, we have not had a case uh, in all these acute patients that we needed to uh, open the abdomen. And trying to avoid uh, trying to avoid IV fluids, but give patients fresh frozen plasma and albumin instead of resuscitating with a liters of liters of fluids. Thank you, Dr. Latifi. Your second question, Dr. Yudika. You are again muted, Dr. Yudica. Yes, my second question is about uh, nutrition because you 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 write a, a very good paper about that. And uh, what happened with you have a lot of fistulas and a big uh, abdominal wall uh, eventration, and uh, how how you do you repair in one step or two step? And where do you put the mesh? We in Argentina, in our hospital, we prefer to do it in one step with heavy mesh put in the retromuscular space. What is your experience? Thank actually, you very much. I actually do exactly the same thing. Uh, I would use it to do it in one step. Uh, knowingly fully, fully well that these patients may be malnourished, and they are. Uh, and, but you cannot, I cannot win the battle with them preoperatively. 
So I'm going to put them on total palatine nutrition. One thing I did not mention, uh, I give uh, patients vitamin C, two grams of vitamin C every four hours for seven days, uh, perioperatively, meaning from the day I operate because our insurances then let us patient, to bring the patients uh, a couple of days before in the hospital. So I do it uh, perioperatively once they come to the operating room. I actually give vitamin C even in the operating room. I ask anesthesia to do it. So I do it in one way. I do exactly, I put the mesh retro rectus. Uh, I use much more, uh, much more often I use the biologic mesh and not uh, synthetic mesh. But frankly, if I didn't have biologic mesh, I would use I would use synthetic mesh. But I use yeah, it exactly you. the same way. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Yudika, your third question. The first one. Oh, it's OK. There were two questions. Okay. Thank it's you very much, Dr. Yudika. Uh, Dr. Claudio Brandi. Dr. Brandi is the Chief of Abdominal Wall Surgery at the Italian Hospital in Buenos Aires, and he will also comment on your conference. Dr. Brandi? Yes. Can you see me? No. Uh, your, uh, yeah, okay. no it's okay. Yeah. Well, uh, it is real, Dr. Ratifi, a pleasure for me to uh, show your, your conference. Uh, I really enjoy the, the case that you prepare, really. Uh, we are agree in mostly of this case, how repair this, this patient. I, I like to, to point out the, the question, your question, when to repair this case it's very, very important, and nobody say that. And the second question is, how will we repair this defect? Uh, we are really agree that the frozen abdominal cavity with fistula is the most complex case that we have to, to repair. There is, in this case, when we have to stop, wait, and think about the technique and when to repair this, this patient. Uh, mostly, we repair this patient with, in two times. The first time we repair the fistula, usually use absorbable mesh, like vital mesh, usually one, two, or three uh, lines of, of mesh together, intraperitoneal together, and try to close the skin or muscle over it. And later, maybe one year later, go to second definitive repair with proline, usually proline mesh in elective repair when the patient is safe. The question is that sometimes uh, you show some case with anterior separator component. The question is we have some patient when the patient has loss of tissue, loss of muscle, and we cannot do that technique or sometimes we, we think maybe this technique used in the second time when the, the, uh, the patient is in better uh, situation. Yeah. You, you understand my, my question? Yes, yes, I do, yes. Well, you know, uh, I really like your, your, your comments and I like your questions. I think we all uh, are in the same situations uh, with similar, very similar patients. I had written in the first edition of the book that we published in Complex Abdominal Surgery that you should never repair, never do an abdominal wall reconstructions, anterior component separation because you're gonna burn the bridge. I think I was wrong, personally. I think I was wrong and I, I re recovered on the second edition because by then I started doing both anterior sometimes anterior and a posterior. It's 
posterior component separation, uh, it's for me works much better for the patient. I think the dynamics of the abdominal wall are much better. I think that the technique that you're using, uh, take the fistulas, put the, uh, some momentum over the intestines and then put the micro mesh. I use two layers. I'm glad you're using two or three, but I just use two big layers. Uh, and then wait for the hernia to come back because they're gonna get a hernia. Almost 100% of them, they will get some sort of hernia. Or maybe some will not. Young people, if they have good muscles, may not. So I totally agree with your comments. Uh, but I, our last, last study and less practice that we, we do now in, a, in an acute phase, uh, in one settings, uh, it's doable and has, we have been pretty successful. Now, let me just say that one setting means I may have to come back next day. I tell the patients and the families that I may not be able to finish today for two reasons. You get tired, meaning you get coagulopathic, cold, you don't look good, skin bleeds, everything bleeds, I will stop. I would do sort of a damage control on demand and then bring the patient back next day and then finalize the, the, the surgery. Uh, so I have done that a few times, but I tell that every patient that I, I do. So this afternoon, I told some patient of mine that uh, is, this may be one or the other. When you tell them they are very happy uh, if they wake up uh, and they are not intubated. So I, I think you do whatever you need to do. If you don't have biologic mesh, use uh, synthetic mesh, putting in this mesh. So I totally agree with your statement and with your practice. Thank you, Dr. Brandy and Dr. Latifi. Dr. Latifi, now we have some few questions from the audience. In fact, we will reach the 105 uh, surgeons attending your conference through YouTube channel. And Dr. Le yeah. Dr. Leme and Dr. Montesino will, will summarize some of the questions. Dr. Leme or Dr. Montesino? Yes, yes. Um, Dr. Latifi, um, from Guillermo Flaflem. You show us a very complex cases with abdominal wall destruction and small bowel fistula. Do you think that abdominal wall transplantation could have any place in some of them? You know, we have not had case. I had one patient uh, in my practice that he had lost majority of the abdominal wall. Uh, I think that one would have been excellent case. Uh, and uh, Dr. Tasaki from Florida, a transplant surgeon had showed very clearly, actually on a, on a first book, I'm not advertising my book, but on a first book that we wrote, he has a paper on that, uh, because I think it's probably something that we should keep it in mind. I never used it, but I think it's, it's very possible to use it when you have no domain or the rectus muscles are gone. If you don't have rectus muscles, it's gonna be very difficult to close anything you do. Thank you, Dr. Latifi. Dr. Montesinos? Okay. Uh, I really enjoy your lecture very much. Here is a question of Dr. Rosa Angelina Pachi. Uh, she asks if there is any place for pneumoperitoneum. Pneumoperitoneum, yes. Pneumoperitoneum, preoperative uh, pneumoperitoneum. Yes, I, I am well aware of the papers who describe that. I personally never use it. Uh, I didn't, I, so far I did not need to do it. Maybe I had patients that I just didn't know uh, how to use it myself. Uh, so I think there is a good place for it based on the literature that has been published. But I personally never use it. Thank you, Dr. Latifi. Dr. Leme? A question from Dr. Ventisky. Do you use any kind of uh, uh, subcutaneous tissue fixation in order to avoid collection or seromas? Yes. So the way this was when we were doing uh, anterior component separation. If you do that, you clearly have to uh, fix uh, the fascia and subcutaneous tissue. Uh, because nowadays I use posterior rectus, uh, posterior, mm. rectus, posterior component separation, and I, have, I saw a surgeon in Carolina who was using a Carter Thomason needle passer. So I put a stitch on a, on a uh, mesh and I bring it through the skin, through transfixation, which is right 
uh, right through the muscle and through the skin and subcutaneous tissue. I don't need to do that. One thing you have to be really careful when you do this, uh, mm. when you go laterally, you can certainly stab the uh, uh, epigastric vessels and you can have some serious complication uh, from that. Thank you, Dr. Latifi. Dr. Montesinos? Here is a question from Dr. Lopez from the Australia Hospital. What's your experience in the use of dynamic closure in those critically ill patients with open abdomen in whom early closure of the abdomen cannot be possible? You know, there are a lot of those uh, meshes and a lot of techniques. Uh, I think many surgeons have described it very eloquently. I have uh, used on few occasions uh, dynamic and what, I, I, what, what is dynamic for me may not be dynamic for other surgeons. Where I close the upper part of the incision initially in the lower part of the incision and then mm -hmm. take the patient back to the operating room a few days later after the uh, has been diuresed a little bit. I give him a lot of vitamin C to avoid to minimize the IV fluids and then keep closing. So I think that's a great technique to do it. It takes a few days. You're going to have to go back to the operating room uh, often. Uh, but I think that's a great technique. I, I use it uh, on occasion. And I think there is one last question from, from Dr. Fafen. Yes, uh, uh, yeah. from, from Fafen. In yeah. those cases where you perform umbilical hernia repair in cirrhotic patients, do you use intraabdominal drainage? Oh, I'm so glad you mentioned that because I actually forgot to say that. I mentioned that it was a drain on a movie, but I didn't say on a film, but I did say that. So thank you for bringing that up. Uh, yes, I do. Uh, if patients have ascites and or have a small amount of ascites, when we operate, they're gonna go down and their liver function is gonna go down a little bit and they're gonna create ascites. Uh, for this reason, I use a lot of fresh frozen plasma and albumin during the operation. So the moment I'm in the abdomen, I put a drain because Sometimes it's like operating in a submarine. You just, you basically un fl flood it. And I'll leave the drain there for uh, until it's less than 300 or so. And the same time I put a drain over the mesh and under the fat, under the, uh, the muscles. So yes, I do this all the time. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Latifi. I think we were able to answer every question that was uh, uh, put by the, by the audience. I thank you, Dr. Ferreres, Dr. Yudik, and Dr. Brandy for uh, their contribution, and especially you, Dr. Latifi, for the wonderful conference. We really uh, would be grateful to have you again virtually with us and to have the possibility in the near future to meet you face to face. Thank you very much I on behalf love that. <laughs> of the Argentine Academy. Thank you. Thank you so much. I, I would I, I really appreciate the opportunity to meet you guys. It would have been. Uh, Awesome to meet in face. Uh, hopefully, we'll do that soon. Thank you very much. Thank Muchas you. gracias. Muchas gracias. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Latif. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. Muchas gracias. Y los invitamos la próxima semana a la presentación del trabajo que ya fue mencionado por el doctor Montesinos. Y les recordamos que la cuarta semana del mes habrá una sesión de casos, problemas en la cual. Eh, habrá posibilidad de participación interactiva del auditorio en esta sala de Zoom. Muchísimas gracias por acompañarnos, queda levantada la sesión.